All right, so I'm Diego Clave. I'm a professor at Northwestern University, which is in Chicago. Um, I'm also director of the Master of Science in Analytics at Northwestern University. So this is a joint work with Gene uh, Hoon Bank, who's a student in computer science at Northwestern, and Matthew Dixon, who is a professor at the Illinois Institute of Technology. So I'm not an expert in deep learning, so with, uh, sorry, <laughs> the other way around. I'm not an expert in trading, so in questions you can trip me on trading, but uh, I know very well deep learning and machine learning, so I'm comfortable in that space. But because I'm not an expert in trading, sort of are partnered with somebody that knows trading, and that's Professor Dixon, okay? So he knows trading very, very well. Um, I have to acknowledge Intel here because this research has been funded by Intel, and I guess you will hear along the way sort of why Intel uh, funded this, uh, this research. All right, so I'm gonna start with trading setting, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit about deep learning, even though I kind of got a sense that most of you sort of know already what deep learning is about, okay? But let, let's first talk about uh, the actual setting. So we are essentially, our model predicts market prices sort of ahead of, not ahead of time, but in the future, right? So and it's more sh short term future, sort of one minute ahead, for example. So in our case, particularly we have a data set of futures market. Uh, so because the Chicago Mercantile Exchange is clearly in Chicago, right? So we established, a, uh, or I established a very good relationship with them. So they were able to provide me data of uh, 50 uh, futures contracts uh, over a span of, I don't remember now, sort of it, it goes back 10 years, I think. So over a span roughly of 10 years. And this is what we use in our study. But the models and everything else that you are about to see are applicable to any, ma any other market. So it can as well be equity markets or forex exchange markets or options markets, All right? So and actually, so I've done work on forex exchange markets sort of in a slightly different setting. So that was actually part of my uh, sort of uh, my own company, so I cannot talk about that, okay? But the point is that everything here is applicable to any market, even though I'm gonna show you only, or I'm gonna discuss only futures markets. All right, so first of all, what is the, what is the setting? So if you, most of you are familiar with this, so you have a bunch of uh, strategy configurations, right? So in, uh, I visited some of the Chicago downtown sort of spy, uh, high speed traders and, and other algorithmic traders and sort of their software sort of you have sort of a pull down menu and you can select sort of among say 50 or so different trading strategies. So here sort of you have, we, are, we assume sort of you're given a trading strategy, right? So that's depicted here as configuration C. And now our model, our model essentially kind of, uh, I shouldn't say predicts buy, hold, sell, but it gives a strong indication whether you should buy a particular uh, asset, hold on it, or sell it, all right? So, and then sort of we calculate, for example, then you can go into profit and loss, draw down sharp ratios, and that kind of, uh, that kind of stuff, all right? So we are not, so what you're about to hear is not about how do you select a configuration, right, so, or a strategy, but it's more once you have a strategy, sort of what you do. So here's, here's the basic setting, right? So, and now you can, we know that this is not a perfect setting, and we are working sort of on more relevant settings, but this is what we currently tackle, all right? So uh, the main problem that we are tackling is, are the given 50 set of securities, are they going to go up by, or which one actually, for at an, at an individual security level, we are making predictions, is in the next one minute, is gonna go up by 10%, is gonna go down by more than 10%, or is going to stay within the band of uh, minus 10 and 10%. Right, so this is, this is the question that we are uh, addressing. Right? So again, we have 50 securities, and for the next one minute, for each one of them, you're making a prediction up, down, or stay put. Right? So this is the problem that we are trying to, to address. So uh, it's probably in your mind, well, so for those of you that are traders, it's probably in your mind, well, I'm not sure whether this is gonna actually help me a lot. And as I said, so we are already working on extensions of sort of make this more relevant to actual practice sort of in, in uh, trading. All right, so that's, that's the setting. Now let me just quickly try to persuade you sort of why deep learning and not sort of traditional machine learning, at least in this, in this type of a context. All right, so uh, I've done a lot of machine learning work and one of the biggest problems is sort of 
you spend, or data scientists sort of spend, spend sleepless hours on trying to figure out what are the features, which one should we actually include it in a model, right? So and this, is, this is a very, very delicate choice, and it's usually extremely time consuming. It even requires sort of interactions with uh, subject matter experts, with sort of business, you know, business folks, et cetera. There are sophisticated feature selection algorithms, but at the end of the day, in most of the applications, sort of it boils down to trial and error, right? So you include some features, uh, you run the model, you exclude some, include my, uh, others, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a, it's a very laborious uh, uh, process, right? And I, I told you that sort of I, in addition to having quite a few PhD students that work on machine learning problems, sort of I have my own company, sort of where we provide data science services, and likewise, in those practical sort of uh, applications when we work with clients, feature selection, it's always sort of the biggest kind of challenge within, uh, uh, within a solution. All right, so then once you have your features, then the next step is sort of which model should you use? Should you use SVM, random forest, neural nets, uh, boosting, et cetera, et cetera. All right, so this is a little bit uh, less of a tedious task, okay, so, but it's definitely dominated by the actual feature selection task. All right, so deep, deep nets, all right? So in our work, we actually use the most fundamental net, which is this one over here, which is a straightforward, feed-forward network, all right? So it's nothing really sophisticated. We are not making any innovations when it comes to the deep learning side. It's more application of deep learning into the trading concept, all right? So uh, what is the biggest kind of difference between a deep net and uh, and traditional machine learning. So in traditional machine learning, you have sort of roughly 100, maybe 200 of parameters that you need to calibrate, model parameters, right? In deep learning, you can easily end up with tens of millions of parameters, all right? So and actually, in our model, sort of, we use four layers, and we have, I don't remember the exact, the exact number, okay, but definitely millions of different parameters, all right? So that's a big, that's a big difference, and what is surprising in deep learning is that even if you have millions of parameters, you're still not overfitting, or the models do not overfit, all right? Um, so that's the point I'm trying to make here. So in future work, so this is a depiction of, of a convolutional neural net, so currently we are not using it, but uh, we have plans to try convolutional neural nets in a slightly different setting, because in a, if you're strictly uh, just dealing with uh, security, sort of, and you don't have any other information, then Convolutional neural nets don't make sense, all right? So, but in some other settings, sort of, we are looking at how to apply convolutional, convolutional neural nets. So, why deep learning? So, why all of a sudden now uh, we can solve problems that have millions and millions of parameters, all right? So, here is so the CPU speed is actually not the reason, okay? Because if you see here from this chart, uh, in roughly 2000, what is this? Two three roughly, right? So CPU speed, CPU clock speed sort of pretty much started to stagnate, uh, stagnate, right? So the Moore's law kind of stopped it this year here. Yet if you, uh, for those of you that know deep learning, sort of in 2002, three sort of deep learning was still not, uh, did not uh, emerge, all right? So it emerged sort of more like 2012, actually more towards the end, right? So the reason for, one of the main reasons of deep learning is actually uh, graphical processing units, right? So GPUs, and this is where now I'm throwing into the mix Intel or Intel Phi, right? So Intel Phi is kind of the Intel's counterpart to NVIDIA's uh, GPUs, right? So Intel actually uh, uh, financially sponsored this research because they also provide, in addition to uh, direct sponsorship, they also provided a Phi processor. And all the experiments that you're gonna see were done on Intel's Phi uh, co-processor. All right, so the point is that CPU actually is not the reason, so clock speed increases is not the reason why deep learning problems became tractable. The real reason are GPUs and uh, coprocessors such as uh, Intel Phi. All right, so this is just sort of a few sort of hints on, on the algorithmic side on what you have to do in deep learning. So, uh, and, and we, we pretty much, not pretty much, we use all these tricks here some are, or all of them, actually pretty standard, all right? So first, keep it simple, stupid, right? So we use straight sort of stochastic gradient algorithms, sort of nothing more fancy, no sort of, um, no second order methods or so. So we essentially just sample records in training sort of over and over again. 
Uh, we use the notion of epochs, which essentially means go through the data in sort of in one shot, sort of several times. Uh, it is, as usual, sort of it's time consuming to fine tune parameters, hyperparameters, right? So we spend weeks sort of fine tuning number of layers, number of nodes, sort of learning rates. How do you want to adapt your learning rate during the actual uh, algorithms? And then sort of we use standard sort of tricks. Uh, we clip the gradient whenever it becomes uh, too big. We dynamically adjust the learning rate. And now we, we use sort of this is something relatively new, sort of uh, what it was invented about a year ago. So we use uh, batch normalization in our algorithm as well. So this is just algorithmic tricks that, uh, that we use. All right, so now let me go into sort of results and experiments, because that's so you pretty much learn sort of what we do in terms of the network configuration. All right, so we have, we have five minute <coughs> mid-price point, points for the past roughly 10 years, all right? So from, again, from uh, CME. And we create features, all right? So and going back to my slide about sort of how traditional, in traditional mix, uh, machine learning sort of creating features is, is an art sort of, and it requires a lot of time. For deep learning, one of the advantages of deep, deep learning is you throw on into the mix sort of whatever number of features you can think of, and the model will do, will do its job. Right? So you don't need to worry about how do you boil down your 10,000 or even 100,000 features into, say, 100 or 200 features. Right? So, and this was the case for us. We didn't really spend a lot of time on feature engineering. What we've done is, you see here in the middle of the slide, we took lagged prices uh, from 1 to uh, 100 periods back. Right? So that's 100 means... Uh, five times 100, so minutes, right? So 500 minutes. We took moving price averages, again, from five to 100, and then we took pairwise correlations of features. And we threw all this into the model. We didn't worry, sort of, are these two securities correlated and these two are not, so maybe that one should be in, that one should not be in. No, we just took everything and threw it into the deep uh, net, all right? So we ended up with roughly 10,000 features, right? So slightly less than 10,000 features. But again, we didn't do any feature engineering, so nothing like how do you bring this down to a few hundreds or, or so. We created roughly 50,000 historical observations. Right? So even though we had uh, 10 years worth of data, sort of we don't want to go uh, back 10 years, right? So essentially, I think, well, you can, count, you can get an estimate, okay? So I think it's like one quarter or maybe two quarters back for uh, training, all right? So uh, we normalized the features, we created labels, right? So historically, sort of, we knew from data, we knew whether uh, the price was uh, uh, up by 10%, down by 10%, or neutral. All right, so, and then we trained on, on Intel Phi. It takes about five to six hours to train the model. All right, so, but it, the, so training is clearly offline, right? Inference in real time was very, very quick. So it's, it's a matter of, uh, I don't know, one hundredth, of, one hundredth of a second, right? So still not, we're not talking about high-speed trading, but for normal sort of algorithmic training, trading sort of that's all acceptable. All right, so let's talk now about uh, the actual prediction accuracy and a deep net versus just one single layer net. So ANN is just artificial neural net, which means one single layer, right? So in DNN <laughs> is the four-layer uh, I think we had 100 no, uh, thousand, sorry. I think we had 1,000 nodes per layer, right? So at least the first layer was 1,000, then it was 900, I think, 800. So uh, decrements of, uh, decreases of 100 nodes per layer, right? So you see here, so the most important number is the, are the test numbers. So tests are uh, trained, sort of are not that much relevant. So single network gives you a test accuracy of 66%. And this, uh, and all right, so and DNN gives you a uh, test accuracy of 30, 73%. So there's an increase of uh, what, 7%, right? Which sort of, uh, you might think it's not, it's not a lot, but if you think about sort of trading and how much money is that involved, sort of, uh, we're talking about potentially sort of quite a lot of money, right? So and these are, the numbers here are averages across, across walk forward strategy, right? So we did, uh, how many? I think around 100 uh, walk forward sort of steps. I don't remember the increments, to be honest. All right, so you do gain by using a deep net versus uh, a plain artificial uh, neural net. All right, so next, just a slide sort of showing you some of the 
some of the um, F1 scores. So this is now the F1. This is, an F, this is the F1 score, not the accuracy anymore. Okay, so that's why the averages are lower. So here you see back plots uh, uh, from uh, uh, a subset of, uh, of different symbols. And you see sort of that the F1 scores, so they hover around 0.35. Right, so but there are some that the median sort of it's much higher than uh, than the average, and then a few uh, symbols that perform uh, lower. All right, uh, then sort of I have a slide. So here what we are showing. So we turn that into a strategy, by the way, right? So this is just this is just pure prediction. This is now we are talking about a trading strategy, right? So we implemented very very naive trading strategy. All right. So again, for those of you that are traders in the room, sort of. You are like, oh my God, I would never use this strategy. All right, so fine. All right, so but nevertheless, sort of, it's a straightforward strategy, you know, that says if label is one, which means it's going to go up, right? So by more than 10%, then close short, open long, and you can read sort of then the opposite in the other direction. All right. So this is the draw drawdown. This is zero. All right. So it's a little bit hard to see. That's zero. This is two, I think. This is three, etc. Right. So the drawdown, sort of, most of the times is zero. For some of the stocks, sort of, yeah, there is, there is a drawdown, all right? So, but it's not that bad. This chart here actually shows you if you have perfect hindsight, so in other words, sort of, if you use the same trading strategy, right? So, but now you're not predicting the price movements, you actually know the price movement, all right? This is the green curve, and then by using our predictions from the model, so if you get a blue curve, so it essentially tells you how much you, you lose. Uh, because you're only making predictions instead of uh, perfect foresight, all right? But remember, this is not realistic, right? So you will never achieve perfect foresight, all right? But it does say, it does say that, first of all, you can see that our strategy is actually uh, positive in terms of net profit, uh, but you are leaving a lot on the table, right? So, but again, this is utopia, right? So that's not realistic. All right, so what are some, what are the pros and cons of deep learning? So. Clearly, it works for complex models, and that's why sort of it's a little bit surprising that, it, that it's not uh, used more often for uh, trading because those all trading problems are very complex. Uh, I like deep learning because there's no need for feature selection, right? So I stress this along the way that that's the case for deep learning. Uh, we saw that accuracy is improved. The cons are it takes long time to train, right? So I mentioned sort of uh, it takes about five to six hours to train our model. Hyperparameter tuning, it's a nightmare. So it takes sort of weeks to actually select the right uh, set of hyperparameters. And then you need expertise, right? So in other words, sort of, uh, there's nothing like, say, kind of SAS type solutions for, uh, for deep learning. All right, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>